Hello, I'm Chris Fowler for Sports Century. No one loved to win more than Woody Hayes. Over 28 seasons at Ohio State, the fiery head coach won 13 Big Ten titles, four Rose Bowls, and three national championships. But football was just part of his passion. Hayes loved his country, his family, his players, and the school where he coached. Some say Woody Hayes loved too hard. Others feel he stayed in the game too long. That game was the 1978 Gator Bowl. One of the great reputations in sports was tainted in an eye blink of history. It's always a shame that a man's life is defined by one moment. There are so many people that if all of their private moments were known, they, they would be defined much differently. Gleason throws it, Jordan is intercepted! Charlie Palmer, the middle guard, intercepted it! Woody had a public moment in the Gator Bowl, but that in no way, I think, uh, should detract from all that Woody accomplished. Woody threw an elbow. There was no thought process in it, it was just a reaction out of probably frustration and anger. The first thing you think of, I'm going to hit this kid because he's on our sideline. He intercepted the pass. He's going to cost us a football game. And I don't like it. So, pow. There were times when he got out of control, obviously. And this time it cost him his job. To have people focus on this one thing is, a, I think, an incredible injustice. He was a crazy old idiot, a stupid, grumpy, authoritarian old jerk uh, who buffaloed a lot of people because he won football games. You screwed us up just about enough for one day, haven't you? Look, at you better move that middle guard or I'm going to kick your ass to the ceiling. Practice is closed, and so here come about 18 writers and Tug Wilson, the Big Ten commissioner. Woody turns around in a rage. I want everybody out of here. I don't know who those people are. Get them the hell out of here. Somebody said, Coach, this is a Big Ten commissioner. I don't give a goddamn who it is. Out of here. He took the yard marker and just broke it over his knee. I'm thinking, geez, I don't know if head coaches are supposed to do that. He hit himself in the temples, knocked himself out cold, whistle comes up, cuts him in the eye. His temper would explode. He could have such a swings of moods. I mean, he'd just go crazy and yell and scream and tear his hats. I think a lot of it was theatrics. He actually would put a little slit on the, the little side of his hat so that he could rip it. Everyone knew Woody Hayes' reputation. He was a tyrant, he was a dictator, a demagogue, all in the football field. A World War II combat veteran, Hayes reached the rank of Lieutenant Commander. He brought to football lessons learned during naval action in the Pacific Campaign. He honored one warrior above all others. I'm in my first Big Ten meeting, and Woody gets up and makes a great, passionate speech about General Patton. He loved General Patton. And that was his hero. Americans love a winner and will not tolerate a loser. Americans play to win all the time. We'd go up to the line of scrimmage and it was patent one through six. That was the automatic cause for our, our goal line situation. To create a scene. Woody Hayes treated his players as if they were uh, soldiers under his command. He's the guy you gotta hit him. His football strategy was based on military tactics uh, overtly. You protected your flanks, you ran up the middle, you stayed on the ground. And there's something about man-on-man -man blocking that puts a kid under the gun. If somebody would put all 11 guys up on the line of scrimmage, he would see it as a challenge. So we would just line up and get the trenches and go to war. If you take it to them, if you don't make mistakes, and you keep taking it to them, hell, there's no question who will win. Woody Hayes was a student of military strategy and foreign policy. Woody Hayes was a patriot whose values were as American as apple pie. There was a time when the president, Gerald Ford, asked Americans not to be greedy and not to get big pay increases. And Woody took it seriously. He wouldn't take a pay raise. Never making more than $43,000 at Ohio State, Hayes placed a higher value on duty to country in peace and war. 
he called me up one day and said, hey, Steve, you want to take a vacation? I'm going to Vietnam. You want to go? And I'm going, they may draft me pretty soon, Dad. I mean, I'm going to be the only kid on my block that vacationed in Vietnam. One man told me that there was a member of his family who was a soldier in Vietnam, and he'd been injured severely. There was a knock on the door of his mother's house, and she opened the door, and there was a heavyset man with gray hair and an overcoat. And he said, I talked to your son in Vietnam. I was over there, and I brought you some pictures. And she asked the man's name, and he said, I'm Woody Hayes. I'm a football coach up at the university. Although Hayes was a strong proponent of the war in Vietnam, he expressed his love of country in an unexpected way in May of 1970. There was an enormous campus demonstration, and I would guess anywhere from six to 10,000 people came. We had 4,000 members of the National Guard on our campus at that time. This place was ready for a major riot. Coach Hayes was very important. He stayed up all night and tried to talk to students and he would ask them what was on their mind, what were they thinking. Woody Hayes was probably the only adult authority figure who could walk through there and get their respect and attention. When you see a guy ripping up sideline markers, you think he's a maniac. When you see a guy punching that kid in the gator, well, you think he's nuts, but he's not. We're talking about the most awesome coach in the history of college football. You say the word glasses and people think stereotypes. But you know, it's just the... Born Wayne Woodrow Hayes on Valentine's Day in 1913, he grew up with an older brother and sister in Newcomerstown, Ohio. Among his early athletic endeavors was boxing for a buck. His father had never attended high school. But his dad became a school system superintendent by going to seven colleges as an adult. His father taught him English and history and said, you know, that's going to be important for whatever you do the rest of your life. That was good advice. He said much of the same things to us. Boys, I don't want you on the football field if you're going to show any signs of apathy. When he first came to Ohio State, some of his players were not doing well in school. He didn't just turn them over to a tutoring program. He took them home, sat with them at their kitchen table, and tutored those kids. I got straight A's my entire freshman year at Ohio State. Woody Hayes called me into his office. He said, well, I have some football players who have a tough time with some of their studies. I wonder if perhaps you could help them. I said, I'd be happy to. He'd say, if you play football for me, you graduate for me. Even guys who had gone into professional football and were making tons of money would get nagged all the time by Woody. When are you going to come back and get your degree? He was a brilliant man in terms of his knowledge of things outside of the, uh, the world of football. He loved to read Emerson. He said you can always pay forward and you must pay line for line, deed for deed, and cent for cent. Because you can't ever give back. You've got to pay forward into the future and help out other people. Uh, he used to stop at hospitals almost every morning to see the children, to see the kids. It's tough a taskmaster as he was and his hard shell outside he had a real soft spot for people in need a graduate of denison university in 1935 hayes coached six years of high school football in ohio establishing a reputation as a disciplinarian one boy didn't behave himself one teacher said what should i do and woody just said well put him down on the floor and slap him one of the fathers of the son that was disciplined didn't care much for it and he brought the thing up and when the smoke cleared the superintendent was fired and Woody was still here. Following five years of active duty in the war, Hayes was hired as head coach at his alma mater where he led Denison to unbeaten seasons in 1947 and 48. After two years at Miami of Ohio, he took over Ohio State, which had seen better days in the Big Ten. When Woody Hayes took the job, he was the sixth different head coach within a span of just 12 years. Going 16, 9, and 2 over his first three seasons wasn't good enough for his critics. But Hayes silenced them in 1954 as the Buckeyes went undefeated. Woody Hayes, who was in a hot spot in Columbus, is the coolest cat in town today. Part of his success was due to an accelerated integration of African Americans into Ohio State's football system, which he maintained throughout his career. He had four great players. They were black. Bobby Watkins. Jimmy Roseboro, Aurelius Thomas, and Jim Parker. 
He played all four of those guys, and he won the national championship in 54. Woody was ahead of the curve, because he treated us all the same, They're like dirt. <laughs> he was the first to put in the all African American backfield. Me, Pete Johnson, and Archie Griffin, a lot of African Americans all over the country wanted to go to Ohio State after they saw something like that. Beyond recruiting African Americans, Hayes privately leveled the financial playing field for those in need. He gave me a, a check for $650 to pay my out-of-state fee. Under a grant and aid program, the African American players were making half of what the white players were making doing the same job. And Dad didn't think that was right, and he made up the balance out of his own pocket. Such personal assistance came to light when a 1955 Sports Illustrated story revealed recruiting irregularities at Ohio State. In 1956, the Big Ten discovered that some players were getting paid for work they didn't perform and placed the Buckeyes on one-year probation. I would die and go to hell for him. They loved him. That's the proper word. They loved Woody Hayes. They were his sons. He would shower in the player's shower. And he thought that that was a good time where everybody's defenses were down to talk about things, things that were going on in that person's life. We went to a movie before every game. However, if, if, if it was questioning the values that he believed in, we were not going to watch the movie. We like some of those old Western movies, something like that. We don't want anything with too much laughter in or anything like that, but it's difficult to get uh, wholesome movies anymore. Playboy magazine selected an All-American team. Woody would refuse to allow that athlete to appear in the picture. Those people are trashy. I don't, I don't go for people like that. No. He just didn't want us in the magazine. <laughs> Maybe because he didn't want us to see the other things that were in the magazine, I don't know. He said you can't play football with an erection. <laughs> Hayes demanded nothing short of total loyalty, which he returned in triplicate. He was available to his extended family, even listing his home phone number in the white pages. Yet to his wife, Ann, and son, Steve, he was not always reachable. The Chicago Tribune has a kickoff thing in Chicago. They asked her to speak. One of the questions was, have you ever considered divorcing Coach Hayes? And she pondered that for a minute or two, and she says, no, 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 never that. Murder, yes, but not divorce. And I can remember talking to his wife, and she said, I have not seen him in eight weeks. My mother taught me how to throw a football and hit a baseball and catch a baseball and shoot a basketball. And he just wasn't there. Just one of these guys had to work about 18 hours a day. And I never saw the man with a deck of cards in his hand, bowling, uh, golf, any of that stuff. In 1957, the Buckeyes won a second national championship under Hayes. And by the 1960s, they were established as a perennial power. Woody had become a popular father figure respected not only among college football's most venerable coaches, but also as a force outside sports. Woody Hayes was the central figure in Ohio politics. It helped a lot to have Woody on your side. The Honorable Vice President, Mr. George Bush. Woody Hayes had friends at all levels, and Gerald Ford was a man that Woody admired, and vice versa. I called the White House, and I asked for the president to tell him that Coach Hayes was calling. I mean, they'd get right on the phone. Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, Woody Hayes was a powerful man. Let's not sanctify these people who have found a niche in society where they can be the god. I mean, power is a wonderful, wonderful intoxicant, and I think there were times when Woody Hayes was just absolutely drunk with power. The reign of Hayes as a coach reached its zenith in 1968 when he won a third national championship amid a 22-game winning streak. But mixed with the glory was a mounting criticism of his old-school hard knocks methods. Are you kidding? Listen. I'm damn it, I'm tired of him. He'd punch you, but he didn't mean to hurt you. He was just trying to motivate you. If you played football through the years I played it, you'd never been hit or kicked in the ass by a coach, then you weren't worth a damn. Against us one time, he kicked one of his own players who didn't get out of bounds. You tell me, where can you do that in society? 
and not get arrested. Now, you make a mistake, and I'm going to knock you down in front of 88,000 people. Do you believe me? Well, I ain't that dumb. Guys. By 1977, Hayes was 64 and not always winning the big games. Of his five trips to the Rose Bowl in the 1970s, the Buckeyes won just once. As his frustration increased, the man who had inspired love and respect just a decade earlier appeared to be losing control. The cameraman was Mike Friedman, and uh, he got into the edge of the coaching box, apparently, to present the best picture possible, and uh, Woody took a whack at him. And said, Woody Hayes, you get doggone tired of cameras being pushed in your face. I'm fed up with it. I make no apologies. And Woody made a horse's ass out of himself by doing that. Well, how do you get rid of this guy but do it the right way? The guy is Ohio State football. You can't just ax him. The three yards in the cloud of dust wasn't working anymore. And when Woody tried to go into a faster passing game, it was like Frank Sinatra trying to sing Beatles songs. He later confided to me, I always thought, even at my age, I could relate to the players. Now I realize I could not. But he said I should have quit two years earlier and uh, didn't. It was 1978. The Buckeyes, with a 7-3-1 record, were invited to a bowl game. Trailing Clemson 17-15 with two minutes left, Hayes smelled victory as his team drove into field goal range. We call a timeout and... Understanding Coach Hayes isn't a big fan of throwing the ball, he agrees to do so under a couple of conditions. Number one being, if it's not open, don't throw it. Charlie Bowman got tackled right in front of Coach Hayes and got up and went like this, and I believe Coach Hayes felt that he was flaunting it. He was just happy jumping up and down uh, because of what happened. Uh, not to rub it in or not to be unsportsmanlike. This guy's never had a ball thrown to him before in life. When you embarrass yourself on national television for the third or fourth time, uh, something had to be done. Like his hero, General George Patton, who was severely reprimanded and forced to apologize to his troops for slapping a soldier. Woody Hayes paid a steep price in humiliation and dishonor. The Ohio State University had to dismiss him, had to dismiss him. And that action was taken that night in Jacksonville, and there was no other choice. He's allowed to be here, and it's nice to see you all survive the holiday weekend. It means you either avoided the freeways or the sidelines of the Ohio State Clemson game. <laughs> On the way home from the Gator Bowl, an emotionally shaken Woody Hayes knew that he had taken his passion beyond acceptable limits. On the plane, Coach Hayes got on the microphone and basically said that I'm no longer going to be your coach. And you could have heard a pin drop the entire way back. It was stunning to see this giant of a man being led down the rear steps of this 727 by two uniformed policemen who just took him, put him in the back of the car, and took him home. What he knew is his kingdom was no longer his. With chagrin coursing deep within him, Hayes made an attempt to mend the damaged fence. Coach Hayes did call us at home and wanted to get Charlie Bowman's telephone number at the dorm and talk with him. Woody said something to the effect of, I'm just an old man, nobody cares, it doesn't matter. What Woody probably should have said to Charlie Bowman was two words, I'm sorry. If he wasn't going to apologize to anybody, Woody felt he paid enough of a price. He did it, they fired him, end of discussion. I got what was coming to me. Let's just let it go that way, and let's just have good thoughts for everybody at that university. I guarantee he's been 11-0 in that Rose Bowl. His regents and his president wouldn't have fired him. I guarantee your ass. Ohio State let him get away with what he did for years and years and years, so long as he was a winner. The moment that he was no longer winning, suddenly, oh, this, this man's an embarrassment to the university. In the fallout of Hayes' dismissal, some sought an explanation for his behavior. 
You know, Coach Hayes was a man who was a diabetic. He didn't always take care of his uh, diabetes the way that he should have. He may have gone off half cocked because he had an imbalance with medication. I happen to personally know that with his diabetic condition, his blood tests, including his blood sugars, were all of it so much that it caused him to have what happened to him in that game. I suppose that's possible, but from the very first day he came to Ohio State, he, he had these tantrums. That's the way he coached. In his final years, Hayes made a number of public appearances, the most significant of which was his induction into the College Football Hall of Fame on December 6, 1983. Five weeks earlier, Woody had returned to the stadium where he was so revered. They decided to have Woody Hayes come back, and the drum major led Woody out there to dot the I. And it was one of those scenes where there were chills down everybody's spine, and there wasn't a dry eye in the stadium. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Professor Emeritus Wayne Woodrow Hayes. The greatest honor was for him, before he passed, was to speak at the commencement. Graduates, friends, and families of the graduates who have done so much in sacrifice, so much to make this possible. Today is the greatest day of my life. When he left us in 1987, he was probably more well-liked than he had ever been. He was a renaissance man. A man with a great sense of history and with a profound understanding of the great forces that moved the world. Most people remember him for his outbursts, uh, and they always will. They're not going to remember him for his record. Graduation rates, winning games, loyalty to his players. All those characteristics belong to Woody Hayes. The last time I had dinner with Woody, he quoted from a poet. He said, and in the night of death, hope sees a star, and listening, love hears the rustle of a wing. And he said the most important thing is not to win, but to hope. Less than a year after he was fired as head coach of Ohio State, Woody Hayes was considered by the Republicans to run for the U.S. Senate against the incumbent Democrat, former astronaut John Glenn. But upon deeper reflection, the GOP decided that even Woody Hayes couldn't beat the first American to orbit the Earth. But don't tell that to Buckeye fans. For Sports Century, I'm Chris Fowler. City and visiting the right coast tonight is the left.